speakers today, Rita Horkin and Mark Hackett. I'm initially going to give a brief introduction to Architects Climate Action Network and our work in Northern Ireland. My name is Kerry Watton and I coordinate the Northern Ireland group of ACAM. And then after our speakers, we have a Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions for any of the speakers, please pop them in the chat box and we'll come back to those. At the end of event, the event at around 7 p.m., we're going to have a little informal uh, Zoom pub session. Uh, so we'll send around a link for that at the end of the event. And that's if you want to come along and have a bit more of an informal chat or ask questions. So to introduce Architects Climate Action Network, was founded on the back of the 2018 IPCC report, which warned us that we had 12 years to um, turn around the curve on global emissions uh, if we were to avoid the worst of catastrophic climate change. So the, uh, this was highlighted by the school strikes for climate and also fought by Extinction Rebellion. Um, at this event in London, a few architects met and said, look, what can we do within our profession to address the um, climate crisis. Uh, buildings and construction materials contribute hugely to global emissions and within the UK about half of our emissions come from buildings either through construction or their use. So that's a huge problem but hopefully a huge opportunity for us to reduce emissions here in the UK. There are 139 countries globally with a smaller carbon footprint nationally than the UK construction industry on its own. So gives you a bit of an idea of the scale of the problem. It can sit between architecture and activism. So we use our professional skills and experience to um, take real action to bring about meaningful change. ACAN is a network of individuals. So we're volunteers and we channel our personal time and energy into um, seeking the transformation that we think is necessary within the construction industry. The three main aims are decarbonisation of the construction industry, ecological regeneration, because of course we're also in the sixth mass extinction of species and cultural transformation. So that's about um, making a profession that uh, collaborates and speaks to one another, both within architecture and within the wider, wider building industry. We are guided by a set of principles which are inclusive and truthful, but we also um, acknowledge that most of us within our day jobs are uh, complicit in the system that contributes to uh, climate breakdown and so we we welcome everyone along in spite of that and we all just want to work together to achieve these common goals so it's open to everyone and please feel free to join so as i said it started in london back in 2018 2019 we started out having in-person meetings and the network grew um, to represent numerous architects across the city um, some of the actions were physical um uh, protests and coming on to the ARB to ask for better regulation, but also the majority of our actions within the past few years have been putting on events like this where we teach um, the wider profession or students or people outside the profession about various issues such as natural materials, embodied carbon, how to work within a circular economy, and all of that is available freely on our YouTube channel, so that's there to access at any time. Uh, ACAN has also run a number of campaigns over the years, including trying to improve building regulations, introduce regulation around embodied carbon, change the curriculum in universities, and that's just, just a very few small sample of, of the actions that have taken place. We're a decentralised organisation, so although we have coordinators like myself and Ivor here in Northern Ireland, and we have a steering group, it's actually really possible for everyone to get involved in any way that they want to, and as well as thematic groups, we also have groups helping coordinate things like today's event. The thematic groups range in subject from embodied carbon, natural materials, education, existing buildings, so any area that you think you might be interested in, something, there's something you can get involved in. ACAN Northern Ireland um, started about the end of 2020. Um, I've been working in London and been involved in ACAN for a few years and uh, on campaigns, including that for the regulation of embodied carbon. And it became obvious that with different jurisdictions in different parts of the UK, different legislations, we really needed local regional groups to tackle the issues separately. And so looking at Northern Ireland, it became obvious that this was really necessary. So until recently, the UK and um, I is the only part of the UK with no climate legislation. And although we've recently had a bill passed, it's not, not the strongest climate legislation. So hopefully we can seek to improve improve that. We're also the 13th worst place for greenhouse gas emissions per capita. So each one of us living in Northern Ireland has 
about double the carbon footprint of the average UK citizen. We're higher than, than uh, the average Chinese citizen and quite significantly higher than someone living in the south of Ireland. So whilst that has to do with things like our agriculture and our reliance on cars and our poor public transport network, it's also a lot to do with our buildings. So this slide was put together by Ben James about Northern Ireland, comparing Northern Irish regulations to that of England and Wales, which we tend to follow, but we have been really far behind in following them. So our regulations are really inferior to our nearest neighbours, including Ireland, Scotland, England, and we just need to catch up. And we're comparing this to, to nations that have in themselves regulations that aren't good enough. So a lot to be done here. Um, one of the first things we wanted to do was highlight that climate change is here and is relevant to us. It's not just about polar bears in the Arctic and forest fires in, in California. This is about as a coastal nation um, and so many of the things that can happen will affect us in, in our lifetime. So these fun images were just sort of made by Rebecca Jane McConnell and to, to kind of provoke that conversation a little bit. I'm just going to go through some of the actions we've done over the past year. And um, the first of which was to be invited by Rachel Woods, who's a Green Party MLA. She's the chair of the All Party Group on Climate Change for Northern Ireland. And that group comprises um, representatives from almost every political party, um, local councillors from different local authorities and other organisations such as um, housing associations. And so it's a really great opportunity for us to come along and talk about one of the causes that we care quite a lot about, which is the carbon footprint of construction. We spoke about our report um, on that, and this is guidance for legislators and trying to understand how they can regulate embodied carbon and giving examples from other jurisdictions and other countries to, to help Northern Ireland along the way. We highlighted the fact that although we focus on energy use in, in buildings, that's often 70% of the building's emissions in its lifetime will take place before the building even opens its doors. So that's why it's so important that we regulate that now. Rachel Woods of the Green Party also helped us put a question to the finance minister on the subject and his department is in charge of, of regulating building regulations in Northern Ireland. And this was about a year ago and it, it did seem as though it wasn't particularly on that department's radar at that time, but he did welcome us along to come and meet with, with the people who um, write the building regulations and the Department of Finance to to discuss this, we were able to give them a little bit more information on the subject and also met again to provide training on that so that they can understand how this embodied carbon measurement needs to take place and how it takes place elsewhere. And so we're just helping, uh, helping people move forward and work in a collaborative way. There was also um, last year, a public consultation on part F of the NI building regulations. So this is about making sure that our buildings are built to the highest standard of insulation. Um, the proposals, whilst an uplift is welcome and well overdue, the proposals weren't particularly strong and one of the options within them was to not do anything. Um, the other two options were to do a little bit or a little bit more than that. So we gathered 125 signatures from people in practice across Northern Ireland, wrote to the finance minister and said, look, we really think this needs to be better and there is industry support for improving regulation. So, the positive outcome from that was that they have decided to adopt the most onerous option. We still think it's not enough and we'll continue to ask for better, but hopefully that little bit of action from us helped push things along just a little bit faster. At the end of last year, we exhibited at COP26 and we talked about, again, how far back behind Northern Ireland is compared to the rest of the UK and Ireland and indeed Western Europe. So we had three public exhibitions. We gave a public lecture and spoke on BBC Radio Scotland about our work in ECAN. And now we're in 2022 and we're faced with the latest IPCC report released last month. And this tells us that, excuse me, that we haven't made the, the changes necessary since um, the report was released in 2018 to avert catastrophic climate change. And really this is our final warning. Um, and so obviously that's a really bleak outlook because the action just isn't happening. But silver lining is, it's not because the technology and the things we need to do to make those changes aren't available. It's really just a case of inaction and a lack of willingness to take that action. So that's kind of what we're trying to do with an ICANN is just take that action 
and be hopefully stubbornly optimistic about it. We're a good bunch of people and it's really a nice welcoming network that you're very welcome to get involved with and hopefully um, help us take the action necessary. So you can follow us on Instagram or email us, but the best way to get involved is through our WhatsApp group. So we're gonna just pop a link in the chat now for that. If you wanna join that network, click on that link, drop in, and there's loads of ways to get involved, no matter what your level is or your skill set, or even if you just want to listen in and find out what's going on, please do so. So the other um, thing I just wanted to highlight is tomorrow night, the Natural Materials Group will be putting on another event on retrofit. And this is about retrofitting with natural materials. So we'll pop the link for that in our chat box as well. But that should be a really good event. Tonight's event, however, it fo focuses on retrofit for Northern Ireland. Um, and we have two fantastic speakers. We have Rita Harkin and Mark Hackett, who I'm sure many of you are all, already familiar with, but both of these people have been long-term campaigners for built heritage and architecture in Northern Ireland. And they're gonna to speak tonight about preserving our built heritage through case study projects that offer practical benefits to today's community needs. Rita Harkin manages the Heritage Transform Programme in Northern Ireland for the Architectural Heritage Fund. Rita will be discussing the Village Catalyst Programme by the Architectural Heritage Fund, which provides funding to bring heritage buildings back into everyday use for the benefit of rural communities. Mark Hackett is an architect in practice, working on the urban issues of Belfast. Mark will discuss his recent retrofit of the Will Store Calden, County Tyrone. This 1832 stone-built former store has been converted into a nursery school as part of the Village Catalyst project that Rita is going to talk about. I just want to thank them both for giving up their time to speak about their work tonight and I'm going to hand it to Rita. Thank you very much for the invitation to ACAN NI. Um, great to be here and as Kerry says I'm going to talk about uh, the work of the Architectural Heritage Fund. Um, um, I've been more involved in the world of architectural conservation for all of my working life and I suppose we've been trying to make the case for all of that time um, as Carl Elefante, former president um, of the American Institute of Architects put it the greenest building is one that already exists and, and it's good to see that um, sensibility sort of breaking through um, with the AJ and trying to mainstream that thinking about reuse of existing buildings. Um, Duncan Wilson from Historic Il uh, England um, remarked that the recycling plastic bottles is a normal part of um, our daily lives but reusing our existing buildings is a much more powerful way to improve our environmental impact. Um, and say so the retrofit first campaign, I'd say of, of late, is very heartening to see that sensibility is uh, becoming mainstream. Um, so the ESAHF encourages reuse, of course, um, and we're a social investor in heritage, but we also want to we do want to encourage good practice in eco retrofit of existing the existing stock of buildings, um, essentially making the most of, of what we've got. And we do very few examples, I think, of, of best practice in this regard. So it's great to be teaming up with with Mark here. Um, this evening. Uh, so I'm going to give you a short overview of the HF's work, um, including a particular focus, as Kerry mentioned, on the Village Catalyst, which is a, a rural regeneration piece. And our work, as I say, is a social investor. We're looking at the environmental, cultural, it's a kind of the, the triple whammy um, effect of, of investing in our existing fabric. So just in terms of setting the scene, Architecture Heritage Fund has been around from 1976, um, but, but particularly focused in this program, Heritage Transformed, since 2017. Um, and as I say, we're a social investor, so our work is our charity in ourselves, and we help uh, community groups, which are charities and social enterprises, find sustainable uses for buildings at risk, in particular listed buildings, um, but historic buildings uh, of whether they're designated or not. Um, which benefit their communities. So it's really about, as Kerry mentioned, about day-to-day -day use. It's not, these are not museum pieces. It's not about um, heritage for its own sake. It's how these buildings deliver um, as vehicles for, for communities and particularly looking at um, economically disadvantaged areas, which could be inner city or um, areas of state with rural isolation. We're funded, we're a charity, as I say, we're funded particularly by the Department for Communities, um, but we'll hear about this programme, the interesting thing about this programme is how it sort of branches out to bring in other departments and work across departments and um, trying to break down the silos through our work often. And Garfield West and Foundation across the UK and the Pilgrim Trust are also um, funders of, of our work here. Uh, 
as a social investor, we, we come in at a very early stage. We're a seed funder. So we're there to kind of shape projects from the very outset with advice and support. Um, our viability grants are about testing ideas, looking at community engagement, seeing what the community needs, um, doing some early conceptual design work, trying to get projects off on the right footing um, to uh, work with, encourage them to work with architects who are uh, properly trained, to work with conservation surveyors to make sure that they're um, going to be quality um, projects at the out, at, from the outset and to set them on, let's say, on the right path. And our development grants and can bring in architects, can appoint project managers, very flexible funding depending on what the particular community needs are. And our loans then can allow groups to acquire buildings and um, provide working capital. So it's a real kind of um, mixed um, bag of funding and support, as I say, very much tailored to the needs of the particular group in question. And this is just kind of a snapshot of the spread, uh, the ge geographical spread, which has been fairly equitable, um, reaching even as far as Rathlin Island and, uh, and getting right into the hearts of communities. And this is really about grassroots um, recovery, grassroots regeneration, and um, you know, taking the lead from the communities who are in the driving seat for these projects. And as a social investor in heritage, we're trying to align these two priorities to find communities and people, vulnerable groups in need and, and marry that with the buildings um, and, and put them to maximum use really. So in this case, uh, a social farm down in Ochlafloy in County Tyrone, where the Georgian um, farmhouse behind them and the outbuildings um, been used for kind of daycare facility and they want to then uh, develop those further into uh, respite care in the evenings and you know, for stayovers and so on. So our grants are there to help them find their way, uh, working with an, the architect in this case, working with a conservation surveyor who's able to um, kind of mentor them along the way in terms of the best practice and conservation led um, approach. In this case, the, the turnaround project based up at the old um, the offend, young offenders um, prison at Hyde Bank looking at the potential for this to work as a social enterprise, a transitional training facility, uh, engaging with community beyond the prison and bringing the community in and looking at bike repair and um, gardening maintenance and so on and to seeing how this can unlock the potential of the people and the place uh, and to bring this very challenging building um, set of stables back to life and a community else's transfer. So we're interested also in trying to acquire buildings from government and try and get um, groups to take them on um, for the benefit of the local community. And the potential for sustainable housing um, would be, be really interesting to talk to ACAN and others about you know, best practice and how we uh, progress projects like this at scale. It's a very humble project, but very strategic in its thinking. Um, Hosford Community Homes working uh, with a homeless they have a homeless shelter to look at, again, transitional housing to provide two units in this case and restore the shop front and bring this building back to life. And the viability work that we've done with them has allowed them to prove their business case and to allow them to acquire five other properties um, recently with um, funding from a, a London based charity. So there's really an interesting opportunity, I think, here to work in terms of affordable housing and heritage and um, best practice and eco fit, uh, retrofit. Um, you know, we, we think we should align the stars in all of these projects. The bottom right picture is just a, an image of buildings that were lost in my previous kind of campaigning role um, at scale. I mean, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of red brick terraces have been wasted and the landfill associated with that goes on and on. So it's trying to stitch back, reuse um, and you know, do what we can um, of a scale and uh, in terms of you know, uh, financial viability to make this practical and, uh, and uh, again mainstream practice rather than building new housing constantly outside the inner core of our villages towns and cities and so our messaging is about what these buildings can do for people in place and particularly bringing people back into the core with the high street revival trying to connect with the high street task force and impress upon the need to invest in these types of distinctive buildings that are uh, convening spaces like the courthouse in bangor uh, with a lot of um, support from the local community through their crowdfunding campaign and asset transfer um, from the Department of Justice and the Right the Cinema in Kilkeel, which has been empty for decades and right in the heart of, of the town. Um, the Women's Centre Social Enterprise taking on the old bank, uh, which was originally the market house in Bangor, and really bringing vitality and life and encouraging footfall um, in the town and people working from home can come to a place um, to bring them together. And similarly with St Collins Hall Trust, 
in Derry, where these monolithic buildings around them are becoming, you know, and very inflexible buildings, which um, haven't attracted a lot of uh, footfall in recent years, but the St. Colm's Hall is there to serve the needs of the community as well as performance space, providing mental health um, provision and uh, potentially youth assembly point. In Riddles Warehouse in Belfast, very incrementally restoring this building over time with funding from HFs via bloody grants plus some capital funding, stitching it back and testing it over time to see um, but in fact, it's been in use through the whole of the last two years, which is phenomenal. Netflix have just left it. They were doing some filming there, but also Black Box and others starting to populate this building and bring it back to life and, and give people rationale to, to come into the city centre in the evening with something as special as this um, unique ironmongery warehouse space. And of course, supporting the green collar economy, supporting those who are involved in the repair of, of existing buildings. Um, and the skills that are in danger of being lost. And in terms of sustainable tourism, um, the very progressive Rathlin Island group who have been working with the Northern Ireland Executive who have cross departmental support for this project from DOI, DOJ, uh, not DOJ, DOI, DFC and DERA, uh, investing in the lighthouse and the lightkeepers houses around it and trying to create a social economy around this and um, create very self-sufficient in terms of energy terms island, very progressive and linked up with Valencia and so on. So it's these small islands that are often in small places that are leading the way in terms of best practice. And then um, as build, the village catalyst has been a real focus for, for me and for HF for the last three years. We've been working on this a pilot program to, to see if these, how we can bring these uh, focal points, these synergies together and, and break down that silo mentality within government about how we can um, deliver on rural poverty and social isolation, tackle um, these deep seated issues, but using heritage as a vehicle to do that and to bring buildings back to life. Um, and so we have been working with the partners DERA, back to DERA DFC, um, and now the housing executive with AHF, finding the pilot projects and working with the groups to bring them forward for capital funding. Charities and social enterprises um, were eligible and villages of under 5,000 population. And the buildings in this case did have to have statutory protection initially listed, but we managed to argue for conservation area um, eligibility as well. So it was about this alignment of the stars, about um, the uses. It could not be about um, uses that were, um, for instance, you know, tourist accommodation or museums or Basically, the use had to be very much about day-to-day -day needs being addressed. And the grants was up to 200,000 per project, but then that brought in, as we'll see, funding from other um, partners and councils, uh, other departments, and the housing executive as well. So the first of the four was the Pat Murphy House in Edirne. And this was a building uh, on, the, on the main street, uh, tobacconists and tea rooms that became listed, was owned by the, the credit union. Um, and the credit union planned to um, demolish at one point, I think, but they, was, but they weren't interested in creating the credit union from the existing building. And that was too challenging for them, but they decided they would work with the local uh, development trust to investigate um, its reuse once it became listed. Um, they got some money from the lottery fund and then they came to the HF for some initial viability work. They did some architectural feasibility work plus um, business case to shape them towards the village catalyst to see would they be eligible and they changed their thinking around from a, like a mini museum and accommodation into this co-working and well-being hub which is just nearing completion and they in this case the building has then sparked off uh, a few other projects the town hall which they manage on behalf of the council they're now um, got plans for that plus a couple of other halls and it has really sparked off in this village a series of other really um, excellent projects which will um, be tied together and really lift, I suppose, the prosperity, the, uh, the overall well being of this County Fermanagh village. And this old post office in Grace Hill lists a building in, in the first conservation area in Northern Ireland, a Moravian village, very distinctive Moravian village. And this building just sits right. On the square in the bottom left, you can see the, um, the old shop, the original 18th century shop and they teamed up with bottom right that talks about the the now group the award-winning social enterprise that supports people with learning difficulties 
and autism into jobs of the future. And because of that alliance, they were able to be um, to come forward for this pilot project. If it had just been the, this local trust on its own, creating this training hotel, uh, then they couldn't have um, made the cut. It was only because of the wider benefit of the group, that the now group we're working with, that they were able to, to come forward. And the Chandler's House are a very diverse range of projects from the training hotel, the co-working space, and in this case, Chandler's House, which is an old soap factory, um, candle makers, Chandler's equals ch candle makers, uh, right on the square in Rathf Island, uh, which the local group um, want to, or in the middle of, converting into for affordable housing units, four units above, and a community space below, uh, with a focus on traditional music, and making the most of the gardens you can see in the bottom right, making the most of the, the gardens, men's shed, um, and bringing life into the heart of a very currently dead square. And you can see from that bottom left image just how critical that building is. And I've got three other inquiries have come in from Rust Island since this project. So it has really had um, a catalytic effect on the village and lifting its fortunes. So just to give you an idea of the condition of these buildings with you know, a lot of original fabric to work around, a lot of challenges in terms of um, retrofit as well. And then the, the wool store in Caledon, which Mark will obviously talk about in a lot more detail. But this was empty for decades. I think it was about 50 years that this building was empty, uh, owned by Caledon Estates, the private owners. And the, the local group um, came to me to talk about this building. We looked at um, uses and their initial thinking was for re residential use. But it became clear that in terms of the village's core needs, that the local school was in danger of closure if there wasn't childcare uh, provision here because people were taking, there was nothing in the village and they were taking their children to the next village um, and the school in itself was closing because the wraparound care was available and they were just going to different schools. Um, and so this is not just providing a lifeline for this building and animating this street and so on, but it's actually um, maintaining uh, the school as well and ensuring it, it remains open. And this is a lot of these projects, as you can see, are partnerships, very innovative partnerships between local community groups and private owners, in this case, um, who have released the building to the group. And the group was then able to avail of funding because we can only, or we're not only open to charities and social enterprises. So it's a kind of this diversity of funding, diversity of um, in terms of the, the players, the partnerships and the diversity of uses, as you've seen as well. And it's really about trying to build this ecosystem of individual projects that are all about tapping into the very distinctive needs of the particular village. And back to the catalytic effect, whenever the plans were uh, made, whenever the plans were announced really for the, the wool store, then the owner uh, to the right who owns the houses on Mill Street, then took those on and began to restore them and the buildings across the way, this fantastic set of outbuildings as well, just come in for a grant, which we've just awarded um, to kick these off with a view to creating a combination of housing potentially and men's shed workspaces and work units um, below. And this is the, the last slide before I'll just show you a very short film, which gives you a, a good more sense of the people involved and the impact it has on people in place. So the pilot was extremely well received by Department of Agriculture, DFC, housing executive and um, has had very good purchase. So they have, we agreed that the, the project would be mainstream for the next five years. So we've 4.2 million allocated to progress these projects. And the ones at the bottom are um, five, many, six, six of the 11 that we've just awarded viability and development grants to um, moving forward. So HF's role is to, to work closely with the groups to bring them forward to see what their needs are and how they can get themselves investment ready for, for this program and to learn from the pilots as well. So we've got a whole mixture of building types represented here. Culmore Fort on the left, um, 1920s Memorial Hall, uh, Georgian House, the old National School in Bush Mills, where I was this morning, um, old workhouse in uh, Clogher Valley down in County Tyrone, and the buildings that we've just seen that I think um, Mark uh, will probably show as well. So we're going to try to show the video.
real wealth of historic buildings here and we want to make the best use of those for both now and future generations. We established a trust um, about 18 years ago now, uh, which um, renovated the old school, did some other work around the village, and then this building became available, uh, so the Trust purchased this building with a view to uh, restoring it and regenerating it. There are three things that we hope to do here. The first is the shop we hope to restore. The second thing is that we will have some accommodation here, so some holiday accommodation, and then we will also have a tea room facility here, uh, which we're going to work in partnership with the Now Group to run. The Now Group is a social enterprise born in West Belfast, but working across Northern Ireland, and we support about a thousand people with learning difficulties and autism into jobs with the future. I think our focus is about how you make people feel. We see the potential for a collaboration to breathe life into a building that needs love. We see a, a really good synergy and created something quite innovative. But everything will have our participants involved in the development and the, the design. We are driven entirely by our enthusiasm. That's why we do this. So I'm really looking forward to seeing it finished and, and seeing what, and letting other people enjoy it, let them see what we've done. We've suffered over the last number of years from dereliction on Main Street, which is typical of many Main Streets um, in villages right across Northern Ireland and Ireland. The community overwhelmingly said, we don't have a, a space where groups can meet together, we don't have a social enterprise really. So we thought then, um, yeah, that's a great idea coming from the community to turn this into a really a multi-use building, a mini community hub. We're going to make Edirne really the place to stop off, the place to stay, the place to visit in Fermanagh. I've been involved in the Regeneration Group since 1997 and we're speaking to you in front of our uh, most recent project. We're hoping to renovate the bank and we're going to have a performance centre in the bottom and accommodation above. So we looked at the needs and we looked at what people wanted in the village and in the surrounding area and one of the things that stood out was affordable accommodation, especially for young families. So we looked at how this space and this building could be used for residential accommodation, and we can fit in four apartments. It will bring young families back into the village, it will bring life to the village square, and it will uh, allow this, this area and this building to thrive, and it will generate an income for the project and for other projects going forward. This is just part of the whole vision that we have for the project and for the regeneration in the centre of town. And it goes together with our community hub that's next door, with our men's shed and the allotments and the community garden project. Once we get totally refurbished, we're looking forward to having crowds of people in from all over to use this wonderful space. When we first came to Calada, and it's a, it's a beautiful conservation village, but it has a number of buildings which are falling into decline, mainly these buildings, the, the wool store and the two buildings beside. When this project started, the two houses started to get fixed, and we're putting in a new garden and a new annex beside this, so we're starting to rebuild the street as well. It's not just about the building, it's also about rebuilding the village and rebuilding the village socially too because a nursery school is a really key function, keeping schools open and for keeping the village working and also for the overall catalyst effect in terms of keeping a group of people together and maybe growing the village slightly. You know, the way it's finished now and the way it's going to be used and when you walk into it and you look out of it, it's fantastic, very satisfying. You, you too take pride in your town and you like to see it move along.
you very much for that, Rita. It was really fantastic um, to see that video and, and hear everything about the work that you've been doing. Um, as I said, we've got some questions at the end, but for now, we'll just move on to Mark. Thank you. So thank you for the invitation today, um, Mark Hackett, a, an architect that probably would have been building around 10 years ago, but in the last decade, I haven't built so much. I was more interested in urban design and strategic issues. So I have been keeping a practice going in those years. This is the first sort of building we've built almost in 10 years. A lot of other work has been refurb and um, studies and business cases and designs developed for social enterprises and asset transfer. So mostly engaged in kind of non-profit and social work in the last decade. Um, this project, you know, was interesting in the sense that I had actually completed a number of childcare facilities in the last number of years in terms of fit out or quick retrofits. So sure starts and so on. So I'd actually built up a little, uh, <clears throat> re rekindled an interest essentially in, in childcare because I had in my early career, I had actually designed quite a few schools in Michael and Doherty about three decades ago now. <laughs> um, and it, the building was very appealing as well in the street, the network. I'll just go through the village of Caledon when I visited first, I hadn't been in maybe for around 10 years. Um, it's actually not that far from where I grew up, but it's not the road that I would generally take, the direction I would generally take in County Tyrone. I'm actually from Tyrone as well. Um, so Caledon is an estate village and it has this, to me, it has had this interesting thing about scale. The church you're looking at there is original design by Nash and has a very, um, as is the estate, has a, a, a frontage by Nash estate um, building but the, the the church is rebuilt in stone but I think the original was maybe laid in timber it was a very elegant church that Nash had built um, then there was these other buildings in the state which are set in an, an amazing landscape as well the main street sort of hugs along a bit of a hill and Mill Street goes down the hill from that so I've got some old maps and, and some old photographs of that um, there was an enormous mill built I think around 1820 maybe. And um, that was originally a corn mill, I believe, but it changed a number of times. And it was derelict by more or less 1930. Uh, I think American GIs were there during the Second World War in the village. I think a lot of them were billeted in there and possibly the wool store. The wool store was more or less derelict a lot of that time as well, which is just on the very left of the picture. You can see this enormous, um, Brick chimney and the flue for that goes onto the street and into the into the the mill and behind is the river Blackwater. Um, so you're looking from the main street down Mill Street there and you can see the mill houses left and right. Um, the other, I suppose the thing that was interesting for me was this issue of scale. Nearby was this original, uh, which looks like a suspension bridge, but it's actually a cantilever bridge. I call guy called Dredge who's making beer and wanted to get his beer from one side of the river to the other in Bath and invented a bridge which is a series of chains that are bolted together so at the time this bridge was put in in Caledon um, as maybe one of only two Dredge bridges left in the whole world um, to get workers across the, the, the river at one point to go to the mill and that was rebuilt and it's kind of really diminutive. So what, what I found was interesting in Calden was this, enorm this enormous chimney that looks dangerous and has been taken down to its base and the kind of um, woodlanders and giles, if people remember giles and the giant oak and woodlanders, you know, fearing that this thing would fall on top of his house and kill him. <laughs> it seems to me that people lived in that street a bit like that with this chimney. Um, so there's an interesting thing from childcare point of view of scale uh, you know, very large things that are going on in the village and very, there was an enormous monument and landscape that overlooked nearby that was, that was kind of blown up in 1973, but this chimney was enormous and then the bridge is tiny. So that bridge is only two meters tall as you walk through and those chains are like the width of your finger. So, so that was an interesting kind of starting point. There was also a beautiful little portico on the estate school that was built for girls actually uh, of both religions by the house. So that was at the entrance of the, uh, 
estate they, they built a fairly progressive school and that has beautiful stone columns i'll come back to that if we remember this idea of using stone columns as opposed to what turned out to be concrete columns so there you see the um the world store as that form we ended up needing to have a new classroom but the idea really came from some of the buildings nearby that's the the the, the stores that you see and the courtyard between those two buildings, which is open to the street, and then the two arches that give out onto the landscape, which is very dramatic. I think I'll photograph coming up of those. And this idea of creating a platform and a garden and a terrace overlooking the street and the, the building composition within the street. So that's an early street elevation with the listed houses on the right, which were all restored. Um, the, mill, the, the building had been used in the 60s and 70s, I think, for growing mushrooms. So it had been rendered on the inside and the floors had been stripped out. So all that was really left was the roof. And the roof had been replaced about 10 years before to save the building. So the building was in reasonable condition in terms of its walls, but there wasn't an awful lot else. Um, so moving in, it's about the idea of creating a, an annex to make the building work in terms of the, I'll come to that in a minute, but the the plan of the building suited getting the staircase tightly wound in around a lift and one good classroom per floor working on the right hand side of the building so that was three classrooms and at that stage <clears throat> it's one of the problems you often find in buildings is you know we look back at these sketches and in one way the smaller building would have been the one i would almost prefer to build um it was three classrooms but it became apparent when we engaged with end users the schools and the health trust at the, for the village, a suite of four classrooms was needed. Um, the after schools function was important in terms of keeping people in the village. And this was about trying to save two schools in the village, one of which was particularly under threat. Um, so that issue of, you know, parents essentially driving out and driving around with their kids rather than be able to go in the local village. So that was kind of really a key point. So it was always this idea of creating a terrace and using the slope site to create a new garden. In, in on the street and ra raised as a platform. So that's some of the early sketches. And look, and this staircase is actually reversed for far reasons, but for a number of points, we kind of had to look at quite a few stair options to make this work. It's very, very tight in terms of all the regulations. But the idea of going in the foyer, having a foyer with a stone floor for prams and, and all that kind of mess that you get, but then everything else in the building, starting to think about how it would be timber, timber floors and so on. Uh, coming up the first floor, the more active kids, the babies go on the ground floor and the more active kids are in the first floor and the next floor up, second floor. But they essentially have a raised ground floor. So they're essentially at ground level leading out into the garden via this terrace. Um, so that put a bit of stress on the project. At, sort of at that stage, we were going, we're already in planning and we had to kind of amend plans and work with listed uh, buildings who were quite supportive in the whole project and also there was archaeology to be done on the site so there was a lot of hoops and processes going on uh, and then the pandemic started just as we're about to go into work in drawings so all the funding wasn't really there for the extra classroom so as we started into work in drawings it was a conundrum of how to afford this and there's the kind of general strategy in terms of the existing trusses the, the lift and the stair would come up and be capped so that the roof could seal through the whole building that was obviously an idea you know many architects would have to just try and preserve that roof even though you're being challenged to put in cellular accommodation there is a sketch of the kind of portico um i think at this point there was a, a, an idea i had been reading those articles about the use of solid stone as opposed to cladding that's uh, there's a number of buildings in london and it, you know the whole idea of the carbon footprint of those can actually be much lower than inspect expected so you're using load-bearing stone columns <clears throat> that effectively are their own surface and are and perform quite well so i had, had the ambition to try and do that but then as i say the pandemic cost and engineering came in this was a kind of photograph has always been a touchstone for me in the last number of years you know the idea of childcare wrapping the room and having vaulted ceilings and high ceilings that this idea that childcare should be in small thin spaces is kind of wrong and actually it's been confirmed to me by a number of teachers that said actually we do need quite a lot of volume because um it just drives you kind of mental looking after 12 young ones so you do need a level of space and volume in childcare facilities 
And it's again that thing of scale. So how do you make it intimate at one level, but actually quite volume at a big scale for kids, in fact, rather than a small scale. And I thought that was always an interesting thing about the village. This, you know, huge disparity of scale. And I see it now with my own three-year-old son, you know, when we go to say the Mac or whatever, you know, a foyer that's 12 meters, 15 meters high doesn't bother him at all. You know, the sense the idea that kids need small intimate scales is a bit ridiculous, actually, of course, because they, they can deal with any scales, but they will go in and, and work at certain things around their bodies in terms of where they play, being on the floor, being at a window and the staircase are, are key places. So that's the plans zooming in. You can sort of see what evolved was this sort of grid of the, the portico, um, which hides a handrail to the terrace and really acts with the hedge. So the important key element here was the hedge as well and the wall. So we're really seeing the, the garden as a, as a platform leading onto the platform created by the entrance and the other building set back and the gable left free. You know, that was a kind of key thing as you come down the street to see that gable not being built in front of. Zooming in, you can see the new then stitching in through how the stair works around the lift is, is very simple in reality, but it's quite complicated in section. So you essentially wind up through the building around the stair, around the lift. And <clears throat> this building, what ultimately ended up becoming a, a, a concrete portico. But the idea of the portico and the seat overlooking the street and overlooking these amazing buildings opposite, that sit in a, a, an amazing landscape, which I haven't really got a photograph, but the fields go down as, as trees and crows, and then you're overlooking the black water. Uh, it is quite a nice setting to the back of this village. This is essentially the backlands. Um, the, the portico with its um, seat built in, and then the staff room and the office really overlooking the street, policing the place, but you know, having that connection to the street works quite well in reality. And then the upper terrace um, done as a deck, so the concrete that we're going to have to use in the retaining wall is then used underneath this deck to get a really robust flat roof terrace with fire reading. Um, but there, you know, even at that time a number of years ago, I was already of the view that we should be trying to minimize concrete. Or, and I also think where you are going to use concrete, you might as well expose it. It's a great kind of finish if you have to use a certain amount of it. It's interesting that in Northern Ireland we use concrete all the time, blocks and render and stuff, but we, we keep covering our concrete up. So many of the architects will know it's actually quite difficult to get reinforced concrete projects left exposed. Some people don't like it. And also it is ironic we use a huge amount of concrete and then we also cover it up with lots of other products. Um, but it's a really resilient material when used well and sparingly. Um, but that's where the use of concrete stopped. Um, everything else was going to be done in timber, including screeds. Um, so all of the floors in the Buildings are done in timber to give a little bit of resilience to the floor when kids are playing on it rather than on concrete screeds. So I've noted that before that concrete screeds are really rather nasty kind of spec to be using in a school at all. Uh, it is much better to have the slight resilience and softness of a, of a timber floor. Um, I'm just going to go through these quite quickly because they're fairly obvious. That's underneath the roof deck in the corridor leading to the staff room. The stair then winds up through the gable and the wall. And then we just used um, new openings and heads formed through that wall, but really trying to keep that wall, of course, all the walls. Um, you can see the rails and we, we picked up this conservation detail, of course, which would have been using tulip wood with a little, little bevel in the terms of boarding, but it's also a, a lower handrail for the kids and the regulation handrail done in mild steel, just um, painted. I think in retrospect, I would have also thought to think about using that in timber as well. Um, again, trying to de you know, you can see there in the stair, we're dealing with using an oak stair. Very keen to not make the building look institutional. I've done so many school buildings now where you're stainless steel and all the kind of normal regulations, whereas I thought that, you know, it's important in a child environment that it's not like that. It's not an institutional building. It's it's something other, it's not necessarily your home either, but it is something other than uh, the familiar type building or a shopping center or anything else that we might encounter. So you wind up around the, you can see how the stairs kind of winding around the openings and, and up to the top floor where you get a landing and the stairs sits about a foot off that wall as well. So as you go down, there's a gap between that stair and the wall which goes down to the ground floor. 
a hard thing to photograph. And then up to there's a refuge for for fire regulations, and then you're into the room behind you, and then you're into this room. So this was the kind of main room. We did a timber boarded ceiling, and all the, the insulations, for instance, where we used layers of rock wool, dense rock wool in that situation. And behind the tulip board, we used um, sheep's wool because a little bit worried, as many would know about condensation. Um, the decision was made at tender stage. The project was really difficult to get through working drawings and tender at the end of the first stage of the pandemic, uh, before prices really ran away. Um, so it was really challenging to get the thing even going. Um, and there, there, we had looked at insulating these walls, though I always thought it was a shame to lose the stone walls. As it turned out, the insulation spec for these walls was just astronomical. Uh, it was coming from Austria or somewhere. So it's another lesson in not using materials outside the country. Um, the, the, the beam, the original beam of the wool store uh, had been chopped off but left. So that used to go out through the roof and, and lift up to those bays that you might have noticed. And um, then the transition between the new foyer through to the, the baby room, there's a little old door that had been knocked in probably in the 80s. It's not an original door. Um, and that's the new fella. So the rooms are then kitted out in that way. And um, having been prompted by lining up with the windows and the deep windowsills, um, I sort of find that this is a really good childcare detail because it allows that board to be painted every few years. And then the roughness of the wall is actually works quite well because one of the problems you find when you do plaster and paint is that it's just kids' hands and teachers complaining about, oh, the cost of getting the room painted. So that's one I've been familiar with that actually tougher materials are actually really good in childcare. So brick, painted brick, the tulip board boarding, which you can just paint and you can kick and it takes the abuse. And you know, it's one of those materials as well as when it gets a few scuff marks, it doesn't look bad um, in the same way as a white plastered wall would. So we were quite glad in the end that the walls could be exposed and we did a cal calculation that there wasn't that much of the wall actually left as a thermal element. And we then discounted that against kind of higher U values in the new build where we're using quite deep timber posi joists in the roof and floors. Um, so in the new build, we did we resisted the idea of doing a concrete floor. We did a posi joist timber floor and we were able to pack that full of insulation. Each floor is insulated. There's an air source heat pump um, that does the heated floors throughout. So it's, it's heated floors throughout. And it's quite nice to go back to the building now as the end user is coming in and furnishing quite nicely and really using even things like the steel beam. Steel beam, another one that was originally specced as timber, but supply during COVID just meant that there was a pragmatic decision to switch to steel. And again, it's all those things about supply chain and the fact that we don't really produce enough timber in this country uh, so that we end up importing far too much of it and that causes huge issues. So I think that's one of the key things we probably should think about. A lot of us are interested in using hemp and hempcrete, but we don't grow it enough and we don't have a processing plant and we don't have enough timber. So every time you want to use timber, you're, you're facing huge problems of cost and supply. So that's one of the challenges I think the island really needs to think about at a much more governmental strategic level is actually materials. Uh, we're just importing too much, I think. Some of the smaller and mundane spaces, the, the staff rooms and all, so it was, you know, the, the concrete has worked quite well there just to make kind of spaces that are, are quite good, even for those fairly mundane rooms. I think this is maybe the last couple of slides. So that's how it now sits. Um, old against new, probably more abrupt than I would really like in many ways. I do look back at some of those earlier sketches. And I think it will take a bit of time to bed in because this wall, I really want to be covered in ivy so that that wall becomes part of the hedge and the stone wall beyond and the grove of trees. And that's what you're looking out at, these amazing deep openings to these sheds. And some of the textures of the original building and you know door that had been blocked up maybe a hundred years ago. So that's I'll try to go through that fairly quick. You can probably take questions. Um, I'll look at the notes here to see if there was anything else, but I tried to talk a little bit about, yeah, we used an air source heat pump, tended to use lino as opposed to PVCs, timber, stone. Um, so those, those materials used also for kind of reasons of being natural and for kids, but you know, 
starting to be very much more conscious of the environmental aspect. So in almost all the insulations, we avoided any of the polystyrene insulations. We used rock wool, sheep's wool, everywhere we could. As Kerry points out, sheep's wool is not always that good from a vegan point of view. <laughs> I haven't thought about. But it is quite interesting that it's, it's quite good at uh, in places where you have condensation with sheep wool apparently performs quite well. So that was one reason we decided to, to go with that. Okay. I think I'll just leave it there. Right Thank you so much, Mark. That was fantastic. And it's really beautiful to see all those um those like amazing images and it's a wonderful piece of architecture. And I sort of in a way want to have a very architectural conversation about it, but since we're in a kind of event where we will we'll focus a little bit more about the um retrofit and environmental um criteria and yeah both of you thank you so much so for coming along and sharing those projects really interesting um we've had a few questions um just want to start this is really for both of you but maybe if if Rita you could kick it off I mean Akon and I and Akon generally has been supporting the retrofit um first campaign run by the edges as Rita you mentioned um, and it's something we've mentioned when we've spoken to Stormont and the finance minister and we're saying you know this is a really straightforward way to not only reduce the carbon of buildings but you know regenerate our towns and cities and um and yeah just preserve built heritage and also make more walkable towns and cities that um, aren't just sprawling indefinitely into the countryside which is in itself losing so much ecology um and these kind of projects of this caliber like we mentioned aren't uh, widespread in Northern Ireland and we just wanted to kind of ask what you, f you felt we could do with this pilot scheme and the work that you're going to do going forward to show them as, as something aspirational for clients whether that's public or private sector and individuals even for architects to come and look at and go look you shouldn't just want a, a nice new shiny building look how much richer this is as a project and how much more beautiful something can be that's retrofit um, so yeah, Rita, what are, you, what are your thoughts on how we can scale this at a bigger level? Yeah, I mean, I think that the first thing is about the power of small, but communicating that, you know, they might individually seem like small and inconsequential projects, but collectively, they're very powerful. And that's what we keep saying to, to government and, you know, to get that message across that it's the interconnectedness of that, that ecosystem that we're developing. And I think the power of these projects is actually about the impact it has on the people. Um, the DFC is, is funding this. Um, they also have the, um, their, it's in their gift within the Community Wealth Building Fund. This is their uh, responsibility rather as well in terms of the asset transfer. So everything that we do about these should be exemplary, whether it's about the impact on people and place, but the way we approach this. Um, so it's that connection between micro and macro the impact on the, the climate, the impact on the population. So we're actually, we're partners with Fit for the Future. I don't know what the relationship is with ACAN and, and I and ACAN generally with Fit for the mm -hmm. Future, but it's how we can, we, you know, when we assess projects, we, we start to ask some questions about environmental sustainability. What are they going to do with that? But I think it's networking these individual projects, um, you know, creating some workshops we could do collectively in terms of, again, setting people off as a good practice and, and it is about um, you know, making, you know, making it appropriate to the projects and the budgets they have, but to do their best by it and not to be scared off. I mean, there is a platinum standard and then there's a, what they can do, but it's you know, tailoring events around that and understanding where groups are coming from and where the projects are coming from, but they all should be aiming for best practice, particularly because they're publicly funded mm -hmm. um, you know, at whatever scale. Um, but it's collaborations between groups, which is why it's so good to be here this evening to make sure that when we are speaking to groups, that we can, um, you know, set them off in the right direction and connect them with other organisations like ICANN and Fit for the Future, um, yeah, and showcase them properly and collectively to show the power of small connectedness. So that sounds like really but you know, it's it's high, it's a showcasing is the important thing in the case studies, again and again. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and Mark, do you have anything you wanted to add to that? Or? Well, I think it, the point that Rita was making there that, you know, even small projects that are viewed by quite a lot of people are important. Um, but the point you were making about the one, Rita, over in East Belfast, where, you know, one organization in a fairly ordinary, humble terrace building was able to acquire and work with another six. So they're starting to create a, a much bigger effect. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's, and I think in Edirne, you can kind of see that example of, you know, the potential for a whole village to start changing. 
I mean, I think we must go through our villages in Northern Ireland with despair sometimes that, you know, the centre of a lot of villages is completely empty and forlorn and, you know, nobody's living there half the time and then surrounded by suburban housing and then a huge filling station with, a, you know, a, a, one of the franchisee food stores and there's no shops left and nobody walks in the village anymore because everything's about the car. So even if you live in a village, which could be sustainable, everybody jumps in the car more or less right away in Northern Ireland. So it does start to address, you know, I think you, you hinted it at your introduction as well about how and why we in Northern Ireland are even worse <laughs> than other places. And I think it is our complete addiction to the car, but partly that's forced on us by our environment that we've left behind in each of our towns, villages and, and Belfast, especially, you know, which isn't a very walkable city. So I keep pointing out that, you know, these issues are very strategic at that level. And the only way, it's a bit like, you know, the only way to, as Chairman Mao would say, is, you know, the way to start a journey is to begin. And I think you have to begin. And I think sometimes it feels like in Northern Ireland that you're so far behind in many ways, or things are sometimes so backward and wrong about particular projects that we deal with. I'm thinking particularly roads ones that I'm working on. But, you know, it is important just to kind of keep those shifts happening. Because at some point, we're going to have to accelerate, as you say. Um, and if we can accelerate our efforts in five or 10 years when the penny drops with more and more people, then the, 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 the point Rita's making is that the models are there and the groups are there and, and the examples are there and the methods are there. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it's very true. I mean, I live in Bangor, which is something like the fifth biggest place in Northern Ireland. It should have a walkable town centre. And apart from the two projects that Rita showed, there's nothing in it. And we have... You know, huge demand for housing. They're expanding the green belt again and again. And there's loads of buildings of like limited, you know, some are lovely quality, some are medium quality that we could be using for housing and, and showing these kind of projects that you've you've done today to someone who's in charge of kind of planning and um procuring you know, housing supply and not, rather than just defaulting to mass house builders would be would be fantastic. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, Mark, you talked a bit, obviously, about the ecological kind of more natural building materials that you've you've tried to use, and obviously, like there are there are challenges to that locally within the supply chain, um, and we all like are trying to do it more and more, which is putting more pressure on that, and certainly the kind of circular economy approach of reusing buildings, and hopefully then reusing materials from uh, demolished buildings or, or reclaim materials as part of that solution. Um, but Rita, could you talk a little bit about whether or not there's criteria within the funding to um, ask people from both a heritage perspective and a kind of indoor air quality perspective and a ecological and carbon perspective um, to try and prioritise those kind of materials in these retrofit schemes? Or is that something that you could look incorporate within the funding in the future? Well, it's not really within this was our, our very early stage funding. It's kind of seed yeah. funding is to it's about economic viability I and mean, our key thing is about sustainable in terms of long term uses to make sure these buildings are going to be used and groups won't come back again for funding. So in our case, it's as much as about the business case and the need being identified is about the fabric. But what we try to do is make sure the groups are approaching the right architects and architects who have the expertise and um, and to try and you know, push them in that, to nudge them in that direction. And the idea of the Fit for the Future partnership is to get them to think with these considerations at a very early stage. And obviously we're funded by the department, so we work closely with the conservation architects who are themselves devising their own guidelines. And, um, and my aim is to make sure that we're front-loading these discussions, that we get them in front of those architects and, and uh, in front of that guidance um, and to get them, as I say, kicked off uh, at an early stage. And then there are other funders like the Lottery Fund and DFC, but I, I don't know if they, uh, any of them are that prescriptive. They would ask them to, to demonstrate, but mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of the thresholds that might satisfy ACAN might be separate, you know, might be uh, sort of lower than, than yours. So it'd be interesting to talk about, you know, shaping that um, and how best practices um, brought to their attention. Yeah, one of the things that we talk about a lot, and it's really learning from places like from the policies that have brought in, been brought in so far in like France and now also in London, is just about reporting so that we have that benchmarking data. So reporting whole life carbon on buildings which is already necessary in buildings of a certain size in London and, and, and 
it's been rolled out in France for a number of years. So you're not really even setting limits on, on the carbon of the project, but you are just asking those people to measure and report. And that helps sort of upskill the profession and upskills the you know, people in building control or whoever need to look at that so that they can start having a sense of how much carbon is going into these things. It's maybe even more applicable in new build, but, um, and yeah. then after a certain period when everyone's used to doing that, then you can start to bring in limits and say, okay, we need to try and keep a typical nursery school under so much carbon per square meter or whatever. So yeah, thank you. That's yeah, really helpful. Yeah, so we're quite a leap from that. I mean, a lot of our groups are very small, you know, community yeah. organizations trying to keep the doors open, trying to yeah. generate come to sustain themselves and it's yeah it's trying to it's, it's maybe it's Paul, as mark says it's incremental slowly but surely to build confidence and to build expertise without overwhelming yeah. and people running away from it completely <laughs> keeping yeah, exactly exactly um and we've got a question here from bobby jill from um i can so he says thank you for the talk and the event um and he just wants to ask about the wider perception uh, again we read it um of the construction industry's impact on the climate crisis um often retrofit projects are sold on heritage or budget what have your been what have been your experiences um and co conversations with stakeholders politicians and the public is environment environmental impact a consideration to them and how can we kind of communicate or argue that better i don't I think I, mean, I think we know that it's a, a very low consideration i think the key will be about fuel poverty it'll be about Day, back to the day-to-day -day stuff, it'll be how yeah. it impacts on people. I mean, somebody was telling me a story that somebody was heating their water to do the dishes by putting a bin bag over a bucket of water because they couldn't afford to put their heating on. I mean, the people are, what's, what we're faced with is, uh, is you know, it's, it's absolutely frightening in terms of and people's priorities. It'll have to be coming at it from, and I think that's why these pro projects have got such purchase and buy-in from the departments because it's about the people in need and vulnerable groups. And you come at it from that angle um, so it has to be coming, I think, from how do you save money? How does this building you know, uh, function better? And how do you reduce your bills? I mean, that's if we come at it from that angle, there's some chance of some purchase. Otherwise, it'll be seen to be the add-on as opposed to the core um, issue. And so, it's so I think it's repackaging, re-communicating about where um, the motivation's from. And it's about people who are um, really up against it. I absolutely couldn't agree more and you know actually that's something that we can hopefully see tomorrow at the ballot box rather than you know we haven't been seeing people vote enough on climate because it's just not you know um their day to day but fuel poverty amongst has grown but also just you know even amongst people who have a bit of money the cost of living and fuel has become more evident that uh, it's something that we need to address um and Mark, obviously, you've talked about, we've got a question here from Mark McCulloch, who's asking sort of about the, the balance of uh, in-use and um, in-use carbon, but, um, and embodied, but, and you've, you've spoken, I mean, obviously, it's beautiful that you've been able to leave the um, internal face of that stonework um, exposed, and, it, you know, obviously, you've, you've worked within the regulations to, to kind of um, achieve the best quality that you could and, and you've worked with heat pump have you had enough um time in oper is, it, is it even an operation yet not quite just about to kind of <clears> analyze <throat> how that's translating and working for your end user like, were you doing any post occupancy evaluation on it or have you got any anecdotal <laughs> feelings of what whether yes. it's, you know, well i mean i think the, the, i was going to say the problem with all these things is about resource and and I mean resource for builders and architects mm -hmm. to actually do this stuff because you literally don't get paid for doing it. Um, and in terms of the fees and the time that it takes. So in relation to that question in the construction industry, I mean, it seems to me, I'll put a controversial out, view out, which is that, you know, part of the problem of our construction industry and the thing is, we, on one hand, we have an obsession with the new. You know, we, we, we have an obsession with the new. We want everything clean and shiny. And I think it's important that projects show that we can reuse buildings and make them slightly shiny and new and clean, because of course you can always clean a building up. So materials and, th and buildings have their, their core worth, um, but you will always have to add new elements to them. Mm -hmm. But how, we, how do we change a complete industry, which, you know, I see that, you know, the architecture and the procurement and the economy so they're all connected so the economy of northern ireland and the way the contractors are working so for instance this contractor what i was going to say was this contractor i'd worked with 20 years ago really good contractor but does not really want to be doing the bigger work where they have to jump through so many procedural hoops myself as an architect who you know in my 50s now look working back on my own in this project essentially I had to do everything on my own 
and just, you know, again, shocked by the amount of hoops and quite frankly, meaningless, purposeless, purposeless processes, which are slow and time consuming, which take you away from your core objective. And I think that's experience everybody working in the industry. Is this, it's not that it's, you know, in some senses, yes, we don't have enough regulation. On the other hand, we have regulations about stuff that we really shouldn't have regulations about. Um, and processes that are overdone and layered and slow. And people on the other side who don't actually say that, you know, this decision is going to cost this person time and money, but it's not going to, in, you know, I mean, getting another report done. So I've had to actually do about three or four reports, um, which, you know, weren't counted for in the budget and do not achieve anything in the end in measurable terms. So I think if you want to get what you're really talking about, which is, you know, a process where clients can understand how their building works and stuff. I think mean, we think we have to actually build that into the budget. We have to build it into the grant structure and we have to resource people to do it and put a higher priority on that than on some of the other things that we do put priority on. So, I mean, I think, you know, I see our industry as highly dysfunctional in the other end, highly dysfunctional. Mm-hmm. And you know my opinion on that in terms of the planning system, which is highly dysfunctional. And you know, everything we do, having worked on the urban sphere and worked with the councils and the different departments in Belfast, the degree of fragmentation. You know, this is a great example, I think, you know, Rita, of breaking down those silos because we do have a very siloed governmental structure here and it's holding us back big time. And I think, you know, five, 10 years time when the really tough decisions come, we're not, we're not resilient for it. We're not there. So it is quite frightening. When I look at that prospect, I get worried. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree with you. And we're just going to have to... But I don't think the solution... To me, the solution isn't about setting targets that people can't achieve. It's about no. looking at the systems and the people. And how, you know, how do you get... You know, the community sector keeps Northern Ireland afloat, I think. And it doesn't get much, um, you know, thanks for that. So people are working in, in non-profits, you know, at a very low level now. It's very, you know, a lot of the non-profit organizations are really struggling. And then you're having this enormous cocktail of funding to try and make any project work. And it's a real difficult job managing six or seven funders, you know, so that there is things within the system that are really holding us back. And I think we really should start to talk about those, but I don't know how we do it because I don't see that many people want to really listen. No, but to put a more positive spin, you were sort of saying, what what was the question? Well, just, you know, how, how have you, I mean, without necessarily carrying out calculations or, or having another report to write, which I agree. I mean, actually, oftentimes in, in architects' indemnity insurance, it's quite hard for us to carry out post occupancy evaluation. And that will sit within um, someone like a, an M&E engineer is better placed to do it in that way. Yeah. But just anecdotally, how have your um, end users been finding using the space in terms of heating costs and operational costs? Um, because obviously you've you've done your best to do you know, well, think, a healthy, breathable yeah. thermal envelope, but you know you've not been able to bring I it up. Thermally, to, yeah, I think yeah. thermally it performs pretty well because anecdotally yeah. the evidence is you know that it's like the big thermal flywheel. Even even the stone walls, I mean, you do need to keep them warm. But when we did a, a, an elevation, you've got two buildings either side. You've got parts of that that are um, insulated all around, so it's not that much stone that's actually exposed. That is through the mm-hmm. envelope. Most of the photographs I showed you was stone that is internal on both sides. So there's things I got to consider. So that I mean that's not the big issue. The big issue is their source heat pump, which was pretty new to me. And it does, you know, if it's not working right or if it's working too high. So I think there's conversations on about how we tune the ventilation and how we turn the heating down and and keep the building running cooler so that you know they're they're ready tweaking up their valves to keep the energy bill down. And I think the longer term thing, we were just talking about it today, is that if that electrical energy, you know, when we first looked at this, I wasn't too keen on an air source heat pump. But when I found out that NIE is, is something like 30% sustainable now and likely to rise, comparing that with oil or gas, which weren't available anyway, as options, you know, you were fairly limited in what you could do. Um, we couldn't really stick solar cells all over the roof. I don't really think that's a good solution anywhere. Anyway, it seems to me the solution for the likes of a village is that the villages should be doing solar and, and, and sustainable and wind type projects for each village. And I think, you know, 
why can't we get into actually generating electricity closer to source and doing village schemes and town schemes? So it seemed to me that, that approach would work quite well in Northern Ireland. And then things like air source heat pump are working off electricity that is also sustainable. So we put in an air source heat pump thinking that it would, um, you know, be drawing off more and more sustainable electricity as time moves on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I didn't feel totally confident about whether our source heat pumps in this case are the right solution in the longer term. Yeah, no, there's definitely an element of, of learning this process as we go along. And again, the grid in Northern Ireland has decarbonized way less quickly than the grid in Great Britain and the rest of the grid in Ireland. So we're, you know, where that principle works really well in Britain, we can say the grid's decarbonizing. It's not happening as fast in Northern Ireland, which is one of the kind of mm. reasons to look to a fabric, more fabric first led approach. Um, but but I think like the, the other thing was, you know, we put in underfloor heating and that system will work no matter what it's hooked up to. So in the future, there's land beyond. If they started to do solar hot water, that could work off. So I think the key thing was to get the fabric of the building right in terms of putting the heat where the children are. So one of the things we notice is that, of course, when the floor is warmer, you could probably bring the temperatures in those those buildings down beyond, beyond what they would normally. They would normally happen up at 21, but they could probably sit at 18 on the thermostat because they're probably 21 down at the ground floor. So I think there's kind of fine tuning like that that should go on. Yeah, no, and it sounds like you've created a very healthy indoor um, environment, air quality wise for the kids as well. But um, yeah, thank you so much. I think we have time just for one more question. Um, Claude, I think, had a couple of questions for Rita. Um, we've answered, uh, I think Rita's answered one of them, but he just wanted to ask roughly how long these projects tend to take to get off the ground, um, seeing as they're all dependent on external funding for social enterprise. Could you give a bit of a feeling for, you know? Well, I mean, the pilot projects kicked off about 20. I remember that there were three or four years, I'd say, on average. And that was even through, Mark, what was that one for Caledon? Even through mm. um, the restrictions and everything, it, you know, it was incredible. I mean, it was the buy-in you know, from the other funders. I think it was, you've got a very strong business case. And some of them were more equipped than others, more um, experienced. You notice one in, Cal in West Ryland, you know, they've um, done five or six other projects in the village. So they're quite, um, you know, um, old hands at this and they in the case of Caledon they had a really good business manager working with the group who was fantastic so uh, and the scale of them they're relatively doable because they're all about maybe four or five hundred thousand on average you know so they were you know kind of manageable and that's what's quite nice about them as well there's something they can happen relatively quickly I think I think somebody said the lottery fund that an average historic building project can I think Jeanette said it was 10 years which is you know oh, wow. crazy so for these type of small scale projects can happen relatively quickly and spark others off and and you could see a change in a village you know over a relatively short space of time having a decades of decline um, and especially with people coming back to live in the villages and work in the villages you know that turnaround could be quite um, inspiring inspirational and, and our hope is that actually the villages are leading the way that will inspire how we look at the regeneration of our high streets in towns and cities too so it's bringing that sensibility about um, people and community-led regeneration using these buildings as a vehicle to deliver across a whole host of program for government outcomes and that's the way you get the buy-in um, from a range of departments as we've seen in this case but uh, the, the opportunity to expand departments again it, it's possible it makes it more complicated but I think they're all richer as a result because of the nature of the richer rich diverse nature of the uses and the partnerships and so on makes them stick I think ultimately when that hard graft is done because it gets properly embedded. Brilliant. And it seems like also then you're getting community buy-in. It's not a top-down thing that's being imposed well, exactly. on these people. It's something they really want and are then kind of maybe, and, and one of the things we talk a lot about in ICANN is kind of this approach of stubborn optimism, like not blind hope, but actually just keep mm. at it. And, you know, we have to deal with this climate emergency. We have to have an optimistic approach. And if people have, like you say, 10 years lead in to get something done, I think it's really disheartening and maybe um, having these faster uh, community-led projects get, build confidence and then maybe they can do things like Mark has suggested and um, you know get involved in community energy trusts and be generating their own energy and you know hopefully um, removing themselves from fuel poverty so it seems like a really great model and hopefully we're going to see lots lots more lovely projects hopefully when you've got them done you'll come back and speak to us about them but um, thank you both so much and there's loads more questions but I think We've probably run over our time a little bit more. Um, yeah, really lovely to see, and hopefully um, that your project mark will be published soon, and we can 
uh, get a lot more uh, reading about the details and everything that went on because it was just really, really beautiful and really well done on, on getting this all off the ground. Thank you for your time. And um, so, yeah, just to end, we've got just a reminder that tomorrow night we have um, an egg can event, which is retrofit using natural materials. So super relevant to those of the conversations that have been happening tonight. So after you've gone and exercised your democratic right, you can come back and watch that at seven o'clock. I should have mentioned Tom Willie's new book, which I just got last night on the, mm -hmm. my, my first employer. So I should, <laughs> I should give him a billing, yes, on that front, very topical. Brilliant. Yes, Tom Willie is one of the people who's really leading in Northern Ireland. Him and, and I believe he worked with Richard Bevan as well. You know, like they're the people who've been saying this stuff for a long time. And, you know, maybe we should have all been listening to him a long time ago. Source inspiration, yes, eventually. Yeah. But yes, everyone buy Tom's book and I don't get any of the proceeds, but uh, I'm sure it'll be really fantastic and excellent. And um, yeah, we can learn a lot about how, how to do these things in this part of the world. And thank you both very much. Thanks. Enjoy the beer. Bye. Bye. <laughs> See you shortly. Bye.